My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, we're here to fight chaos and day drink. And we haven't found the chaos yet. It's power behind the throne. Our first segment is the basic crawl. Power Behind the Throne is a 128-page adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition, originally published by Games Workshop in 1988. We're reviewing the Hogshead Publishing version from 1998, which includes an additional short adventure at the beginning called Carrion Up the Reich. The authors uh, of the original uh, Power Behind the Throne are Carl Sargent, Phil Gallagher, and Graham Davis. The Carrion Up the Reich material is by James Wallace. It features art by Chris Baker, John Blanche, Paul Bonner, Les Edwards, Charles Elliott, Tony Howe, Martin McKenna, and Russ Nicholson. Now, this is a large book, so we are splitting our review into two episodes, and not in the first half, second half way that would normally be possible. In this case, we can't. So in part one, we're looking at the setting, that is the great city of Middenheim, and the supporting cast of prominent NPCs that live there. Part two will look at the sinister chaos plot underway in the city, and how that works when your player characters collide with it. So, the content about the city includes sections on the place, the people, government, religion, especially the cult of the wolf god Ulrich, and then details of the city's districts. Additionally, there is a section called A Place to Stay, which details the Templar's Arms Inn and its staff. And then at the back of the book, there are maps and appendices, including things like NPC reference cards, a chart of the carnival attractions and timetable. When the PCs arrive in Middenheim, the city's great carnival is just about to begin, and it forms the backdrop for the whole adventure. So there is an entire section about events, that are going on and that the PCs can go and visit or take part in, and various street encounters with different minor NPCs and groups that are found in the busy city streets all around them. And most importantly, there are the characters. And I will warn you, this section contains a plot spoiler just in the name of one of the NPCs. So there is Joseph Sparsam, the Chancellor, Dieter Schmiedehammer, the Graf's champion, the Graf being the ruler of the city, there is Raleigh Lafarel, the elvish court minstrel. Katerina Toddbringer, the quote-unquote princess, the illegitimate daughter of the Graf. Hildegard Zimperlich, the chaperone. There are the midden marshals, who are generals. There are some wizards. R. Ulrich, the high priest of Ulrich. Emmanuel Schlagen, the Graf's spoiler alert paramour. Then there are three ladies at court. Siegfried Prunkvoll, the knight eternal. Alavandrel van Maris, the elvish master of the hunt. The amazingly named Gotthard Goebbels, who is the Commissar of the Merchants' Commission, and the almost as incredibly named Luigi Pavarotti, the baronial physician. And then finally, there are the Law Lords, the Supreme Justices of the city. Let's talk about how we have used this module in our games, and specifically the city and NPC Mm -hmm. portions, which we're covering today. Uh, Tom? Right, well, I GM'd the adventure, that took 10 sessions of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition. Although I should note, our sessions are only maximum two hours each time. So if you were doing traditional three-hour slots, I would say this would take you six or seven sessions, perhaps. I have only read it in preparation for this show. So things we liked about this portion of Power Behind the Throne. Okay, so this is the first thing I'll say is about the whole mod- module, not just uh, the portion we're covering. And... It is that you will be delighted to hear, Tom, that I actually have come around on the illustrations <laughs> <Right>. here. <laughs> um, I sort of notoriously did not care for the illustrations in Shadow, uh, in Shadows of Bogenhofen, and um, the other one Death uh, the Reich. With, with the awesome, yes, Death in the Reich. Uh, I actually have come around to it. I don't know if it's just you know. 300 pages in, I've just been worn down, and here we are. Um, It could totally be that. Uh, Or it could just be the fact that I actually think it really fits, um, in particular with Power Behind the Throne. The illustrations are just, they have this thing where they're just kind of like crammed with people. There are just people on top of each other in all the illustrations, not all the illustrations, but many of them. They're just kind of 
climbing on each other and laughing and and screaming and and you know carousing and um and it's just this mass of humanity in the illustrations <laughs> that I think is kind of great and I think it's appropriate for this particular setting which is the city of Middenheim at this particularly packed time like when they're you know they have this big festival going on this carnival there's a bunch of outsiders there uh the streets are just kind of flowing with people right and so i really like that part of the illustrations they you know these characters are still um incredibly ugly uh they just they're just not yeah. attractive <laughs> characters at all um but you know they're all drawn with a lot of texture they are um you know they, they are in very like very well researched sort of period dress. Uh, there's a lot of humor and whimsy in the illustrations. So I've, I've come around to the illustrations. The other thing I think I really like about this part of Power Behind the Throne, you know, we're talking about two things today the city and the people in the city, right? And as far as the city goes, this is a very impressively rendered urban environment. Um, I had kind of a similar note for Shadow over Bogenhofen, but here it's very turned up to 11. And that's that there's this emphasis on civic concerns and laws and customs and rules that make it feel like a real city. I mean, the major plot device, I know we're not talking about that part yet, but the major plot device here is a set of unfair taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And I found that to be so interesting. And, you know, Middenheim here is not just set dressing, right? It is a vibrant ecosystem. And as you're reading it, you're getting this, this feeling, this sense of Middenheim. There's a rhythm to it. There is, um, it's kind of like pulsing with life, right? And it has a lot of detail that suggests that, you know, if you were, if we look at adventures as ecologies, right? Like we're typically presented with dungeon ecologies and, and really good dungeons take a lot of care with like, why are the monsters there? How do they behave? What are they up to? You know, what is the, what's the terrain like? What's the environment like? How do you experience this sort of, you know, wilderness kind of setting, right? And this is like that, but for a city. That that ecology is the rules. It's the customs. It's the traditions. It's the it's the civic concerns. And I just found that so fascinating. Yeah, I think it's really good the way that NPCs are all tied to certain institutions and that affects how they view each other or even whether they know each other at all. But the fact that it's happening during the carnival, I think, is very valuable because it means you're not walking into this state that's in equilibrium and, and kind of pushing things off balance. The city has already been slightly transformed because, for example, you know, the Great Park is not, would normally be, a, I assume, a serene um, relatively quiet place full of trees and lawns. But right now it's being used for a beer festival and there's like a, a music tent or something. And and so because everything, everyone's walking all over the city using the streets and different areas for things that they're not normally for, that kind of gives you a brilliant opportunity to sort of go around and, and look at everything that normally goes on without having to interfere with it and kind of bump up against the ordinary goings on of the city. Does that make sense? No, it totally makes sense. It's like you're getting, I mean, you are in some sense, you know, you are like one of the revelers who are from out of town, right? I mean, you're kind of there getting a a sort of Disney version <laughs> of the city in some sense, right? You're getting like this, you know, the city is putting a certain foot forward, right? And you're kind of getting that experience of it, you know? And I, 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 I think that's a really interesting approach. And I think you're right about that. Like you, you kind of feel the city, you, you get a sense of it as 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 an ecosystem, as a place, um, as a real place, without having to like interact too closely with it, without having to get too caught up in its you know um, in its you know detailed inner workings or whatever. So great. Speaking of the carnival, it is so lovingly presented. <laughs> um, yeah. That's the only way I can describe it. It's so lovingly presented. The authors clearly had a great time writing about the carnival and all the details that are kind of. Uh, that are kind of like a part of that. Um, I, I particularly loved. This was one of my chain lightnings, and so I might just drop it. But I'll just because I want to say it now. But I really love this. They talk about the buskers um, and how the buskers, how anyone can be a busker, right? Like you can just you know grab your your lute or whatever and and start playing and you know do your thing. But the custom during the carnival is people get to like kind of judge you 
And if like you are not busking well, if if the particular talent you are trying to express is not uh, is not satisfactory, they take you. They can kind of report you to these like sort of busker judges that are kind of roaming the streets, right? Who will then like force you to do better. And if you don't, you have to spend some time in the stocks. I mean, it's just that kind of detail that uh, that I found to be very amusing. And the carnival part is loaded with stuff like that, like just all the different activities, all the different types of, you know, vendors and all that kind of stuff. It's just it's just really vibrant. Oh, it's good. And in play, it is is so much fun just being at the carnival, because without going too much into the plot part, you kind of start the first few days of the adventure um, unknown to the players that the GM is kind of introducing them to things that are going to be important later. But they're basically just, yeah trying out craft ales from around the empire or uh, going to watch the ice dancing or maybe and and it's interactive as well so like um minotaur fighting in the stadium that was great we had one of our pcs go and do that and his friends bet against him because they were convinced he'd lose he didn't um you and there is a tournament to become the next champion of the ruler of the city and if you win you genuinely that happens to your character which is way cooler than you know i don't know 66 amusing things that you might see going through a circus it like this is stuff that will change your character but it also just has this knockabout if you lose it doesn't matter kind of feel to it and uh yeah we just had a great time basically having the characters at a loose end and just partying until they accidentally started doing the adventure let's talk about the characters because i think that this is the real centerpiece of power behind the throne this module this adventure is about personalities and power behind the throne i mean it is loaded with personalities these characters they're great i was reading it and i instantly had a better understanding of why you love this so much because i know from having watched you and played with you um i know that you like to do voices and you like to do characterization right and there are just so many opportunities here for that style of play Am I correct about that? I think I. I think I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the characters are so good. Uh, the 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 one, the Eternal Knight, um, stands out as a really really great character. Uh, but there's a lot of fun ones. Yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about it is that they walk the fine line between being different enough from each other to you know remember who is who without just becoming a caricature. Like even the clownish characters, Luigi Pavarotti, the physician. Uh, Siegfried Prunkvoll, the Knight Eternal, who we'll come back to him. Uh, they have some depth to them. Like they're not just this. This guy is a fun Italian stereotype. He is that, but he also cares deeply about his patients and so on. And that makes them really good to to play and to interact with. And they're still funny when they're meant to be funny. The relationships between them as well. When you talk to them about each other, or the relationships they have feel believable. The friendships, the enmities. I will say there is slightly too much detail in the write-ups. Like you can't flick through the book while you're running this and and grab details easily. But the layout is such that the important information is laid out. Like what does this person want? Uh, How much power do they have? How do they feel about so-and-so? Where will they be at this time on a Wednesday? (laughs) That's all done really well because you need that in a hurry. I can see why people shied away from this in the classic Warhammer era. There would be a lot of talk back in the dark days when it was out of print on your web forums and warpstone zine letters and stuff saying this is too much i can't take all this in um but i think if you're brave enough to take the plunge it's it's really rewarding yeah i agree about like the characters feeling very real i mean the connections between these characters feel so rich so substantive um the kind of like the city they're not set dressing, right? They're not here just to speak their one or two lines of helpful exposition. So the player characters can, you know, go on to the next part of the adventure. Right. I mean, they have lives, they have desires, they have aims, they have rivalries. And like you noted, they have a schedule, right? You can kind of track where they're going to be at any given time. I don't normally love this kind of thing. If I'm being honest, I'm still a little unclear whether this is something I myself would want to run, but you have to admire what is what what I think is probably a very, very bold exercise, right? It takes a lot of nerve, I think, to say, you know what? We don't need monsters. We don't need treasure. This adventure is going to be about people, <laughs> right? And people talking to each other and people being assholes to each other and you getting wrapped up in their lives. It's a confident approach, you know? And it sounds like you had a great time with it. I'm not sure it's my thing, but um, but I but I respect it, I think. No, it's it's not everyone's thing. Uh, we had one one player in our group was kind of 
I sign up for fantasy adventure. I'm not really enjoying this, and that's fair enough. I mean, so and there are there are some kind of combat encounters and adventure things thrown in uh, later to appease uh, that need, which is let's be honest, part of the promise of Warhammer. You're supposed to be fighting chaos warbands every so often, right? Yeah. Um, but that said, it's a really interesting exercise we we ended up calling it a court crawl at one point just these weird little dramatic situations it's set up really well for well in my notes i've said for comedy but actually for all kinds of interesting encounters like it's not just gags in names though there's plenty of that and puns and stuff the gag writing is not as funny not as good as the previous installments but where power behind the throne really shines is it will do things like let me give you an example the pcs will fairly easily make friends with the court physician because he makes friends with everyone he's a guy that if you look at his illustrations you'll notice he very much loves life once you've made friends with him well he's an influential guy at court and later they want to go and talk to princess katarina to do that they have to get past the chaperone and to get past her they have to know someone notable at court so of course the natural reaction is to go oh we know that luigi guy we're great friends with him and that's when they discover to their horror that she thinks he's a dissolute rake and that nobody who's friends with him should ever meet the princess under any circumstances. And and of course, that and that set off like a whole session's worth of adventures trying to find out a way that they could make her change her mind so they could talk to the princess. And it's this very convoluted Bertie Worcester kind of thing, but with a very serious undercurrent because there is a, a scary plot happening. And uh, th- so those dynamics are like, at first when you look at them, it just looks like a random collection of people who do or don't like each other but actually there's a lot of careful alignment so that when you blunder into the middle of it you find yourself in interesting situations i know you had some other notes about some of the other characters you enjoyed before we kind of move on from characters we've got to call some out yeah there's the ladies at court there are three of these they're quite presented as quite minor characters but actually you'll find we found at least our pcs interacted with them quite a lot because they're just more approachable and they had good little mean girl style dynamics going on between them the law lords actually they're fairly boring and and prosaic but uh, it turns out if you've got some people in your group speaking with english accents and some people with american accents this can lead to some confusion <laughs> like like law law lords like l-o-r-e and we're like no law lords like are you, are you messing with me or what <laughs> so, and then finally yeah the, the naples ultra of power behind the throne characters the Knight Eternal. Now, this is like a ceremonial role they have in the city. He's a guy who is essentially, he wears magic plate armor and he has to patrol the city because there's a superstition that if he ever doesn't, it will fall and, and terrible things will happen. But he's not actually a, a fighter or anything like that. He's just this kind of pompous idiot who yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I based quite heavily on Alan Partridge. And he's just a great love to hate character. Like, every time I introduced him in a scene, the players would all go, oh, no, not this guy. But then when he wasn't in a scene, they would try and engineer ways to force me to bring him along so they could interact with him again. So. Yeah, I loved that character on the page. Uh, just a, yeah, just a, I mean, a person who's, like, function in the city is purely ceremonial, but he has, like, these grand ideas about his importance in the city and uh, just a just a real ass, basically. I, I, I kind of really... I was really into that character. I was like, yeah, he is great. Like he's a great character to have show up periodically. Um, and I also, this kind of reminds me of something else I kind of liked about the game or about the module, which is the naming conventions are really fun here, right? Some authors do this where the, where the name of the character, like totally says something about the character. Right. Um, and I think that this is a good example of that um, because the Knight Eternal's name is Siegfried Prunkvoll, which yeah. is um, just amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, an amazing name. So, yeah, yeah, I kind of really, really dug that. So many good characters. You know, like I said, this module really stands out for that reason. I'm not sure it's my thing. I don't know how much mileage a module like this can get uh, nowadays. And I think we'll talk about that. You know, you have to respect this approach. I mean, it's, you know, it's 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 a very specific kind of approach that says, you know, we're going to do this, you know, to, to hell with the tropes of dungeon crawling, right? I want to kind of go to presentation for just a moment. Sure. There's a tremendous amount of GM support in this book. I don't know that I game this way. In fact, I know I don't game this way. Um, it's a level of detail that I'm not personally comfortable with trying to manage. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't, that has no appeal to me, but I do appreciate that there is a tremendous amount of concern for the GM at like every step in this book. And I really appreciated that we have 
very, very detailed approaches for each major NPC, like everything you need to know about them. Uh, lots of advice on how to run the adventure, uh, timings of things and that kind of stuff. There's this, I, I thought very clever, there's this part of the adventure where they talk about like special movement procedures and rules that take into account the fact that you're not just running through the streets of a city, you're running through the streets of a city that is packed with revelers, right? And I thought that was a very clever thing. And I thought it just kind of showed that they they have really thought about this at a, at a quite granular level in terms of like how to make this feel right and how to run right, you know? Uh, those NPC cards in the back of the book are, are interesting um, as a tool. I'd be curious to know how those, how those work and play. Just a tremendous amount of GM support. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, it's great. The NPC cards uh, are justly renowned in Wolfrup fandom. Um, and I use them a lot. I didn't cut them out or anything, but they're just there in the back of the book, so they're really easy to flick to. And uh, I did also use the top part of them with you know picture, name, what they do, and I made those into handouts for everyone on Roll20 so they could flick through them as they desperately tried to remember what the heck everyone's name was. Because it, I think it's 12 major NPCs and then like yeah. another half a dozen maybe maybe 10 slightly functional ones like guild masters and stuff it's a lot to remember for everyone so um yeah i think you couldn't reasonably ask for more, more support than than you get because if there was more support you'd need help <laughs> you'd need help keeping track of that too yeah yeah exactly uh one last thing i want to say about this book i know we're not covering it as part of this podcast series but there is a little adventure that we mentioned up top called Carrying Up the Reich, which is a sort of preamble thing that was added to the Hogshead version. I, I liked it. <laughs> I really liked it. I, yeah. I, I read it before I realized I wasn't supposed to read it. <laughs> and I read it and I was like, oh, this is pretty good. Uh, the the sort of villainous character, uh, Matthias Blucher, uh, is a real dastardly SOB. And um, uh, just kind of, I really liked some of the little, the little happenings in that little little tiny adventure yeah they don't all go anywhere the things that happen in that but actually yeah i, I may mention a few things from that in part two when we talk about the plot because it is perfect yeah. has some import yeah so my big question is and we've been kind of hinting at it already is would this module work for the way games are played today you know, which is to say, I think the module was written at a time maybe when the gm was expected to do uh, a bit more performing, a lot of voices and characterization. And I feel like nowadays that's something that we kind of de-emphasize in our sort of modern play culture, you know? Um, how do you feel about that? Like, does this have legs in 2019? Is there a point in even playing this if you're not going to do that, right? Like, what would, you know? Well, I mean, yeah, there is, I think, because it, it's got that good character-based investigation. It's got that going for it. But I would say it would be way harder for the players to keep track of who is who if you don't have an enthusiastic-ish um, <laughs> person doing the NPCs and, and all the visual aids and stuff, illustrations to remember who's who. Without that characterization business, it's just so important to lock in to your head who everyone is because there's no kind of geographical restriction on where they might be met exactly, you know, they're all sort of floating around the city. Um, I think if you want to play this, you have to embrace that approach. Like, if you're playing Power Behind the Throne, you're playing the GM does... 12 impressions of people uh <laughs> the adventure i don't think there's a really practical way to do it without that so i've been in sessions like say at conventions where the gm is just frankly not any good <laughs> and um maybe a little boring and dry but you know there's still some you know there's still some dungeoneering going on there's still you know kind of monsters and kind of like stuff mm -hmm. like that, that you can sort of grab onto as part of the fun even if the gm is not really bringing it right and i tried to imagine myself with a gm like that playing this and i think i i think i'd want to i don't think i could do it no no i it, it just wouldn't work there are things going on there are player driven actions uh like you know um rpcs managed to borrow an elephant for the night so they could make an impressive entrance to a garden party but like which is pretty good but yeah it doesn't it just no it's very character based and everyone has to kind of bring it and i think the players have to do that as well like if they're just quite boringly going through like a list of questions about the mm -hmm. mystery or something that's not fun they have to kind of engage with the, the characters you know flirt with them argue with them that kind of thing if you don't do that it, it's not fun my other question I've mentioned that I think the level of detail with regards to civic matters is very impressive here. I'm curious how much of it was actually used in your game. For example, did you have to pull out the chart that covers the the rate of of, of tax assessment at the gate? Like, did that is that something that came up? 
Uh, yeah, that, well, that's quite an important uh, plot setting point. So I definitely use that. Uh, the point is, of course, that it's way too much an absolute daylight robbery. Um, other parts of it I didn't so much, like the guild structures and things didn't come up quite as much. Uh, but I was glad that it was there. And I don't know, in fact, I found myself occasionally flicking over to the accompanying uh, City of Chaos source book that was published at the same time, um, which is just Middenheim, the setting book for like 100 odd pages, which... I don't know, which makes me wonder about my question, which is, is there enough stuff about the city in power behind the throne itself? Um, do you need more details than that? I guess the answer is no, because you seem to be impressed by it. No, I don't think so. I think it's plenty. I mean, I will say this. It's a kind of detail that I'm not sure makes me want to come back and visit it again, if that makes sense. Like, it's a level of detail that's really good for this adventure. But for example, if you think about some of the, like, uh, what are some of the great like city settings from D anD D that are so fun? Like um, Waterdeep, I Waterdeep, guess, yeah. and the little sort of like evil community underneath it in the sewers or whatever. Like those are those are presented in a way that have like a lot more variety, and the details a little bit more like fantasy, a little bit more grabby in that way. So it doesn't have that kind of detail. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that I think I'd want to. I, I don't think I could like keep revisiting Middenheim just based off this. But you're going to get so much out of just this. I'm not sure that you even need to necessarily. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I sort of wondered, since we're deliberately divorcing the plot part from the characters and setting part, does this work as like a, if you need a city-state with a, a court and some minor turmoil, but you don't want to follow the power behind the throne a chaos cult plot, spoiler alert, not really, uh, d do you think it would work? Would you be able to use these NPCs yes. as a... Okay. Yes, no? uh, okay. ab absolutely. I think the I, I think the NPCs are presented in a level of detail that you would not have to try very hard to like incorporate them into other adventures if you wanted to. Um, in fact, so much of like their drama and their sort of interpersonal stuff that's going on, a lot of it has nothing to do with the plot of Power Behind the Throne, right? It's just their lives, you know. I think you could keep using these characters for sure, even if you even if there's not enough of like. Middenheim to want to keep coming back to Middenheim. I think these characters want to be revisited. And so in that sense, maybe that's the, that's the answer to the other question, right? Like maybe these characters are enough to make you want to keep coming back. Right. So the chain. There is a joke about the length of an opera that is only noted. If you look carefully at the carnival timetable, specifically the ring of the Nibel Ungolid is in two parts, each of them six hours long. Which is actually not that far off Wagner's ring cycle, but he at least had four episodes. This book has a very particular sense of humor, I'll say. And one of those jokes is uh, not good, but worthy of note. At one point, one of the events is the ice dancing competition and the sort of star, uh, the champion of the ice dancing is an elf named Torval Undine. Am I giving it too much credit to think that's also a pun on the water nymph, the Undine? Probably. Okay, my next one is, I like the detail when an urchin has stolen a pie, that as he runs up to the PCs, he takes a big fat bite out of it so that the pursuing pie seller can't claim it back. So good. There is a menu for the Templar's Arms uh, Inn, which kind of figures prominently in the story. Uh, nice little menu of, of food items. I kind of love details like that in fantasy games. Yeah, there's uh, one bit on it which, where you can get one of the cooks, and I quote, more flamboyant desserts. And then my final one is, I enjoy that the Chancellor's blackmail problem is driven largely from the fact that he is too posh to know how to go out and buy drugs. Let's go to the expert delve. It's the expert delve. Pretty straightforward expert delve this week. And that is... How do you handle a large cast of NPCs? <laughs> um, this is a huge cast of NPCs, but it is not singular in that way. I have played many games that produce lots of NPCs. And so we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can sort of handle that, both in terms of your organization and prep as a GM, as well as uh, presenting it to the players and how the players can sort of keep track of all that information. So a straightforward topic but a good one. And I'll say that most of my notes here are cribbed from other expert delves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying too much original here, but it's, it's all in one place right now. I want to start off by saying this is one of those areas where playing online is a real strength over face-to-face. -face. 
because shared online tools can be very powerful for keeping track of everything. And my my big case in point here is the game Urban Shadows. Urban Shadows is a urban dark fantasy kind of uh, game, which you might have guessed by the name Urban Shadows. Um, it's basically Dresden Files, the RPG, right? Uh, powered by the apocalypse. The mechanics generate lots of NPCs. Like after a couple of sessions, you've got like 20 NPCs, right? In face-to-face play, it's a fucking nightmare. It's so much, and it's ha- it's happening so fast, and it's hard to keep track of, and you're constantly having to like re-explain things. But online, you can just use a Google Sheet, and in that case, it's not so bad. Uh, you can have a Google Sheet with a tab that has just the NPCs and their motivations and their factions. Um, you can have a picture board, so you can have pictures of the NPCs, which helps everyone kind of get on the same page with what they look like. It's just a lot more tidy. Um, as compared to -to face-to-face play. And so at the outset, I will say that something like Power Behind the Throne or a game that has lots of NPCs, that's going to be much easier online, don't you think? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was invaluable because I ran this, I ran Power Behind the Throne online uh, through Roll20. So we had the map, it's the shared screen. And of course, it has the handouts function. And I started off only uh, giving the handouts of who each major NPC was when the players had actually met them. But I very quickly realized, because they were being referred to by people, I just I gave all of the handouts t- to everyone. So they had a picture and, and a name and a note of who they were, uh, just so they could kind of sort through them. You know, when your player character is not on camera, you can be flicking through the notes and making your own notes on it and so on. I think that saved everybody some, some massive headaches. You did a similar thing when we played uh, Melandros together, actually. And again, I think that was something that was easier because we were playing online. Other things you can do to help manage a large number of NPCs, we've already kind of noted it before, but I think that having a characterization for each major NPC is very, very helpful. Um, It doesn't have to be a a voice necessarily. It can just be a manner of speech, um, a body tick, a verbal tick, just something that you do to embody the character. That's something I've talked about on previous episodes, but I think it's very important here. It's particularly important when you have a large number of NPCs because it... It's a way of easily telegraphing to the players that you're you're someone else now. I've definitely talked about this before, but my thing is to kind of assign an actor to each NPC. Not one that you can actually do an impression of, but just someone to keep in your head while you're talking. So for Power Behind the Throne, most of my references were actors from the north of England. As another kind of consistency thing, I've assigned different regional accents to different like elves and dwarves, the classic one. And uh, they're not Scottish, the dwarves. Uh, and so for Middenheim, it's for, it's up north. Uh, so I had Sean Bean as Dieter the Graf's champion, uh, Melanie Sykes, who you would not have heard of as uh, Kirsten Young. Um, and and you can also cast against type. So I had the comedian Johnny Vegas as one of the very serious law lords because, of course, there's no actor's face to go with it. So that it's completely opaque to the players. And that just helps keep a consistent-ish kind of tone of voice or reading of the character. And then the other thing I did to help with the portrayal, which you cannot do face-to-face unless you are very skilled with, I don't know, holding up masks or something, is a Google Hangouts portrait trick that I nicked from the game designer Todd Foley I saw him do this with when he was playing I think his game I don't know what's it called the one about traveling through strange dimensions of space what you have to do is have your NPC portraits lined up in a folder open it up in any kind of software you want and then share your screen but don't do the presenting to wall thing on on Google Hangouts or whatever you're uh, talking on and that means that whenever you start talking the camera flicks to you and the NPC's portrait is showing to everyone instead of your face. Um, it worked really well in Power Behind the Throne. I have not bothered doing it in other adventures. Don't do it like just, you know, when the goblin leader shows up to address the PCs when they're at their campfire or something. It's not worth it for that. But for something like Power Behind the Throne, it was really good because it would just help everyone remember <laughs> who on earth they were talking to at any given time. Another thing that I would recommend, I think. You know, sometimes you just have to recap things, (laughs) you know, there's no getting around it. I think it's very wise to recap at the start of a new session, a great way you can sort of get everyone back into the headspace of what's going on and getting all the characters sorted out in their brains is to just go through a recap at the start and say, okay, last time this happened, this happened, this character is doing this, this character was doing that. You have some clues about this. You have some clues about that. And you suspected this and you suspected that. And, you know, that's just a thing. And you, and you sometimes have to do that in the middle of the session too. <laughs> it's just unavoidable, right? You may have to just say, you know what? Here's what's going on. Just a reminder, you know? 
Yeah, and in fact, I found it was useful to... I assigned essentially a guide NPC, one of the elves, I forget which one, maybe the minstrel, that they'd made friends with early on. And I don't want to stray too far into the plot thing of Power Behind the Throne, but basically what you have to do to do the mission is persuade enough of the main NPCs to help you out, figure out which way they voted on a thing, get them to vote your way. And so I just had this elf essentially go, hey, lads, maybe you could help me out. I think we need to persuade these people to vote this way. And then every 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 so often he pop up and go, all right, how's it going? Have you talked to the princess yet? What about this guy? And that was <laughs> right, like, yeah. that was just the, the reminder and not just reminding them what they're supposed to do, but also to actually assess how well they were doing or how well they thought they were doing, which is useful for me as well, because if they think everything's going great, but in fact it isn't, then it's kind of on me to make sure they have a better understanding of the real situation. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's a, that's a great trick too. I mean, that's that's kind of a, a nice sort of in fiction way of doing a recap as well, right? On the GM side, this is another thing I've talked about before, but I think it's really helpful to take some notes on the module that help condense things a bit. That's particularly the case here because there's a lot of detail in this. I take notes on NPCs and I, and, and I work off my notes actually, like that's what I use in play. I don't really use the module. Um, you know, I take note of like important things that happen, the NPCs that are important and that kind of thing. Right. For the NPCs, what I do is I always take note of their name, their motivation and what they want from the player characters. Like with those three bits of info, I can do a lot without having to refer to the module. Right. Um, I, th- I just think it helps you be a little bit more nimble at the table and, uh, the process of making those notes also helps you internalize the module itself. That's great. And one final note I would have is don't have NPCs actually keep any secrets about how they feel about other NPCs or whatever from from the players. Power Behind the Throne is quite bad for having, say, a paragraph of someone's true feelings. And then the last line will give, I'd say something like, but they will never reveal this except and then some circumstances that would never happen. So it's much better just, you know, have them get drunk and say things by mistake or have them not get drunk, blurt out how they really feel and then retract it unconvincingly. It's not fun to keep the secrets. And, you know, you've got to watch out for that. So when you're doing your notes, actually, that's another thing to highlight is stuff that you really should reveal somehow. Yeah, this is it's a separate conversation, but secrets at the table are a pain in the ass, right? Role playing games are not like fiction in this way. In fiction, it's okay if characters have secrets because that's part of what you're, you know, the way you interact with a piece of fiction is such that, you know, you want to find out the secret and you like being kept in the dark. And in, and indeed, it's not an interactive thing. So you don't have to actually act on anything, right? Role playing games, secrets and things are harder because players need direction. They need to know where to take their character, where to take the story. They need to have a good sense of like, am I doing the right thing? If you have a bunch of secrets, if the NPCs are just like loaded up with like inner truths that they never reveal, it doesn't give you much to work with as a player, right? Um, and so maybe that's a great topic for another expert delve, but I do think that secrets at the table can be kind of a mess. And that's just to sort of piggyback off what you said there. Listeners, those were our tips presented no particular order about how to <laughs> how to manage a large cast of NPCs. Let's go to the Companion Adventures. It's the Companion Adventures. Tom, you got a film, right? Yeah, I got a film. It's called Vatel, which is a historical drama from the year 2000, directed by Roland Joffe, actually, who last episode we mentioned the mission. He directed that. He also directed this. It is about a major domo at a French nobleman's palace in i want to say the olden days and he's played by gerard Depardieu. and uh, who else is in it i think tim roth is in it maybe uma thurman someone like that the king is coming to visit so they have to throw a massive party that's a big problem it's not the most amazing film but it's great for dipping into to get this whole vibe like in power behind the throne of the relationships at court and how they're kind of dysfunctional between the aristocrats who enjoy it who just live there and then the people who actually make it work like someone who even in quite a high ranking position like a chancellor or you know the, the senior judge in power behind the throne they actually have a job to do and the friction that leads to so yeah that's worth a look uh, v-a-t-e-l vatel is how you would google that fantastic uh any other film uh type recommendations I certainly do. Uh, I have a film and play uh, by Tom Stoppard, who uh, 
translated the screenplay for Vatel. In fact, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. The film version stars Tim Roth, sensing a theme here, and uh, Gary Oldman as the titular characters from Hamlet. It's funny and absurd and uh, just really worth seeing. It kind of follows Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as they weave their way behind the scenes, sort of in and out of the plot of Hamlet. And that might well be the way that your Warhammer characters feel when they're doing Power Behind the Throne as these sort of slightly lower class bumbling oiks who are patronized and ignored by the great and good and get into comical and often depressingly dark adventures. Fantastic. Let's talk about music. I have uh, been turned on to the music of Richard Dawson uh, by uh, my friend, Ollie Jeffrey. And I think that the Richard Dawson album Peasant is a pretty good fit for this. Peasant uh, was released a couple years ago. It is a concept album about a community of people in like 600 AD, <laughs> you know, sort of like, uh, you know, England, like right after, you know, Rome, fall, you know, fell, that kind of thing. And the, the, the tracks are all like individual people and their role in the community. That's kind of what the tracks are named after. And the music is sort of folk. Um, this particular album has a kind of horrific bent to it in a way. There's a lot of like intense imagery in the songs, but I could imagine some of these songs, I mean, setting aside their slightly, you know, modern day sort of orchestration. I could imagine a lot of these songs being sung like on the streets by one of those buskers, you know, um, in, in Middenheim. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to recommend that one. Yeah, I, I listened to a few of those tracks when I saw your note. It's it's weird. It's like if Derek Bailey decided to do folk. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting album for sure. Yeah. Uh, my music recommendation is, well, I, I started thinking about what, yeah, again, what music would you hear on the streets, but rather than doing the kind of folky peasant music, I was thinking about the kind of gala events they have, you know, they have the or orchestral performances and so on. Uh, so I went looking for Renaissance era music and I got the Ensemble Renaissance, an early music group from Serbia. You can find them on YouTube and Spotify. I think the album that is best as like background music for Power Behind the Throne is the one called Gems of Medieval Music. Let's talk about game stuff. I'm going to recommend a story game from about four years ago or so called The Clay That Woke by Paul Sega. The Clay That Woke is a game about minotaurs, and the minotaurs live in this, this sort of fantastic city where they are kind of an underclass of, of people. In the game, your lives are like just playing these minotaurs and kind of trying to fit in, being these sort of like very, very second-class citizens. And it's a great game. It has a really innovative and interesting uh, sort of token drawing mechanic uh, that you use to resolve everything. But the reason why I'm recommending it here is because, well, two reasons. One, Minotaurs figure prominently in the uh, in Power Behind the Throne. That is true. <laughs> and so I kind of like the idea of this other look at Minotaurs, in particular, like Minotaurs that are used for like gladiatorial combat, right, and that kind of thing, um, just to to enrich the experience. The other reason, the main reason why I'm recommending it, you know, Middenheim, as we've noted, is presented in a very, very believable, real, textured way, and the city that the clay that woke takes place in is also presented in this way, but it's different. It's just, it's a different kind of vibe. It's a different aesthetic. You know, if you want like examples, other game texts where a city is presented in a very, very textured way, a way that really makes it feel alive where the culture comes alive. Uh, the clay that woke is fabulous. It, it is amazing. And uh, my gaming resource recommendation is from the awesome lies blog. Uh, once again, the enemy within companion, the power behind the throne section uh, it's quite plot heavy, but the if you want to use the carnival as a setting, it also has a bunch of very useful handouts where uh, the author Gideon, I think he goes by, has done kind of flyer pamphlets and posters for the various events at the carnival that you can give to the players so they can kind of look through what's on today and go, oh, hey, I want to go to the, the snotling ball match or or whatever. So that was good. Fantastic. Listeners, that's our show. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at GauntletRPG. There's a website, gauntlet-rpg.com. You can discuss uh, this episode and other RPG matters on the forums, forums.gauntlet-rpg.com. 
We are on Patreon if you'd like to support the show monetarily. It's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Also, I want to throw out a quick note that um, I have set up a Discord for Fear of a Black Dragon and other projects that um, I personally am working on, which uh, will have links in the show notes for that, but it's totally free. If you want to come hang out on the Discord, that would be awesome. We'd love to see you there. Tom's there as well. And yeah, that's all I've got. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Jason. And thank you to our iridescent editor, Luke Quaid. Take care. Bye-bye. That's our new joke, right? Finding adjectives for for Lou. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the important thing is I only start thinking about it when we get to this. Yeah, like... like, like, So they're always terrible. I I can tell you've thought about it like two seconds beforehand. (laughs)